Hello, welcome back. Thank you, as always, for joining me today. We're going to continue the thread of the last conversation about all of this being a dream. It's an idea that we hear in different forms of spirituality. If you're familiar with Buddhism or any of the Eastern philosophies, this is something that runs throughout those traditions also. The fact that this state that we appear to be in here is in fact a dream. This is a dream. So in this sense, A Course in Miracles is hardly unique, but because that's what this video series is all about, we're going to continue to refer to the Course in this conversation and in all of them, in fact. So today it's chapter 18, section two, once again, as it was in the last conversation. So what we're looking at here are dreams and what's really going on, which is something that we're prone to resist. So you may, over the course of the next 20 or so minutes, find yourself encountering some extraordinary resistance. And, and maybe you won't. And if you don't, that's fantastic. You can expect it at some other time. And uh, the longer you study and practice this material, the more you recognize, well, that's true. <laughs> and, and honestly, it's true about any spiritual path. So, this is, in fact, a dream. And again, let's consider the dreams that we have when the physical body is asleep. The state that we call slumber or a nap or sleeping at night or sleeping in the middle of the day or whenever. The dreams that we have appear very, very real to us. And that they are, in fact, testament to the power of our own mind. Because these images that we see, these beings that we appear to interact with, all seem real. They do. They all seem perfectly real. And when we're dreaming a dream, we feel like we're in it. And we're a protagonist in it. We're maybe an antagonist as well. Yeah, or both. Or we may just be wandering through, wondering what is actually going on. This is weird. But a dream is testament to the power of our mind and its ability to make a world. Really, we wander through a dream landscape, and then when we wake up, it's gone. And we don't think anything of it even if the dream was hot and sexy, and we wished that we hadn't awoken, <laughs> right? Or if it's scary and we're glad that we did, maybe some of those emotions stay with us, but we recognize right away that it was a dream and it never in fact took place. Our mind has the power to do that. So we wake up and we do life here in the world, whatever that involves for you, whatever station in life you're in, if you work or don't work, yeah, if you have kids or don't have kids, or a dog or not, or a cat or, or whatever, an email inbox that's stuffed full and you can't wait to delete all of the messages or something, yeah, or as many as possible. Yeah, we all go forth and we do life. And the dream that we had at night or during our nap in the afternoon is gone. And most often, we don't even remember it. I mean, how many times have you found yourself thinking, oh, I had this strange dream last night, but I don't remember it. Yeah, it's common enough because we go forth and we engage in what's known as the waking dream. Now, why is this a waking dream? Well, 
what has not gone anywhere is our desire to change reality. Our desire, our wish, and our want to make things other than they are. To substitute our own made-up dream reality for reality itself, which is completely unchanging and, I might add, completely unaffected by everything that we do here. Truth is true. Sounds, sounds so obvious that it's almost preposterous sometimes, right? But it is. Truth remains exactly as it is. Even when the physical body is awake and we call it the waking state, it's still a dream. Our wish to make reality other than what it is remains. Our wish to be an individual human being, a self-sustaining survival unit, a unit of economic consumption and competition, which, like it or not, is how our governments view us. I mean, they want us to vote for them and stuff, but, I mean, you know, th that applies no matter where you live in life, right? We have all of these systems in place that are representative of our wish to be separate our wish to be individual and all of our dreams are, in fact, a protest against reality. And we're the ones protesting. This very section of the course likens our dreams to a perceptual temper tantrum where we so want to be separate from God that we've fashioned an entire world where we think that we can run off and hide. We think that we can run off and do life and still have the peace of God. Yet we discover here in our serial dreams, one after another, one moment after another of illusion, that we don't have the peace of God, even though we may get glimpses of it here in the dream, and even though we see and experience some beautiful things, some beautiful moments, those are symbolic of who we really are, but they're here in the world. They're dreams just like all of our nightmares. The form is different. The content is still the same. It's exactly the same. So whether we're having a waking dream, which is going on right now, or a dream when we're asleep, that's merely a difference in form the content is still the same. It's our protest against reality. So you can see where we're going with this and where the course is leading us with this is to drop the protest against reality and allow truth to be just as it is. You'll hear that multiple times. If not today, another day. And if you've watched many of these videos, you'll have heard that many times before. Yeah. So, sleeping dream or waking dream, it is, in fact, at its core, the content is the same. It's our wish for things to be different than how they really are. Now, that is what we're awakening to, is how things really are. You'll have heard me say in these videos that ideas leave not their source. In other words, thoughts remain in the mind of the thinker. What this means in the context of dreams is that it's all in our mind. 
The dream is in our mind. It is. We, we're seeing with our mind when we're asleep at night and we have a dream, whether it's beautiful or whether it's terrifying or both, or whether it's just flat weird, we're actually not seeing it with the body's eyes at all. We're seeing it with the mind. Actually, the same applies to the waking dream where we appear to be seeing it with these things. In fact, it's in our mind. Ideas leave not their source. Thoughts remain in the mind of the thinker. Waking dream or dream while we appear to be asleep, no difference. We're asleep right now. That's what they call enlightenment awakening, by the way. It is as fitting a term as we could ever make to point to an experience that's beyond words, of course. Awakening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is apt. This is a dream. Thoughts remain in the mind of the thinker, which means all of this is in our own mind. We think that the dream is outside us. We look around at other people and we think they're outside us. We look at their different houses and buildings and we think they're outside us. They're different nation states and continents and all of the stuff that we appear to see appears to be outside of us. It is not outside of us at all. It is not coming at us, rather, it is coming from us. All of the figures that we see in a dream are acting out something in our mind. They're acting out our own wishes and desires in our mind. When you see warfare, it is a symbol of our deep unconscious guilt. When you see people doing something loving, it's symbolic of who we really are. It's coming from us. Now, this is an idea that the ego will resist. Expect it. You may be getting it right now. It's always the ego, by the way, that resists. This is coming from us. When you experience discomfort, that is an opportunity to forgive. Forgive what comes to mind. Forgive what appears on the screen of life. It's a dream. Forgive it. Release it to the Holy Spirit. The practical centerpiece of A Course in Miracles is the practice of true forgiveness, the miracle of true forgiveness. And many videos are devoted to this. And if you're not sure what that is or involves, I am always happy to drop in a video or two here into the stream, into this procession of videos and go through that in more detail. So, if, if you would like that, definitely please let me know. I, I drop those in every so often because it's so important. Anything that is not wholly joyous is, in fact, an opportunity to forgive. So when we're dreaming and we want to believe it's real, so we make it real and concrete and stuff, we make it real in our mind. It is as inconvenient as it may be to hear, or as uplifting. I don't know. I don't know how this lands for you. It's our protest against reality, which is unchanging. God is unchanging, eternal. That's what eternal means. It's changeless beyond all of our conventions of change and transformation, beyond all of our ideas of space and time, the world itself, bodies, interaction with bodies, social status and prestige, wealth or poverty, all, all of that is beyond all of that. It simply is. Truth simply is. We're engaged in a process of allowing it to be just as it is. So what do we do here in the world? Well, while we think we're individuals, we form what the Course refers to as special relationships, which we've talked about at length recently, you know, just to summarize what that is, the special relationship has a very different definition here in A Course in Miracles as it does in common parlance, as, as you might expect. I mean, expect that. 
You, you can certainly expect that. What it means here is an exclusive relationship. A special relationship takes many forms, in fact. They can be special love relationships or special hate relationships. I'll explain what I mean. A special love relationship is where you love one person or a group of people more than someone else. You esteem some people way more than others. It's a separation mechanism. I mean, this applies to familial relationships, business relationships, political relationships, our intimate personal relationships, our marriages, our romantic partnerships, all of that. When you really think about it, they exclude. Special love relationship. Now, the special hate relationship is the exact same thing, taking a different form. Remember, the outward form may differ. The content is exactly the same. Special hate relationships involve our special disdain for certain people, like an abusive ex, for example, or a political party with whom you vehemently disagree. That's an example. Maybe a nasty and abusive boss or former boss, or somebody that you just don't like. When we undergo the practice of true forgiveness, it is very common indeed to find that you can forgive some people very easily, right? Yet we're tempted to hold out our little judgments and blame for the select few, the unworthy, as we deem it in our ego-clinging mind. Yeah, well, our forgiveness must be total, or it's not at all. <laughs> That's something that we learn here on the way, is that you can't hope to awaken the truth of who you really are if you're still judging and blaming and hating on some people and not others. That's a special relationship. So at this point, it is very, very common for spiritual students or seekers or course students, however you would refer to yourself, to throw up a giant protest and say, well, I'm not giving up my special relationships. Well, I mean, if you're happily married, as I am, you don't have to give up your happy marriage. Don't get any spiritual teacher wrong at all. That's not what we're saying. So let us not go there, please. If you do, and you'll know this if you have, you will delay yourself a lot and cause yourself a lot of pain and suffering and frustration. No one's saying radically change your station in life. Keep your happy romantic partnerships. Keep your well-paying job if you want to. Continue to live in your home if you want to. Continue to show up living life. You don't have to give it concrete reality, but we still appear to be here, so we continue to live what looks to be a normal life. I mean, this looks to be a normal person. Well, you might dispute the normal part, but you see what I'm saying, right? What you see before you is actually nothing special at all. It just takes a form that we can relate to. It takes the form of a human being, takes the form of a middle-aged human being with gray hair who's seen a thing or two. I mean, <laughs> or three. Yeah, it, it's a form that we can all relate to here in the world. When something connects for you, it's not this form that you're looking at on your screen. It's the Holy Spirit that's speaking to you. Please count on that. What we do here is 
if you've got loving, special relationships, keep them. However, here's how you use them for joy and love. Here's how you use them to spread forgiveness, joy, love, laughter, all of that. Give them over to the Holy Spirit. If you are happily married, give your marriage over to the Holy Spirit for his purposes of spreading joy throughout this spinning ball of rock that is in such need of it. It deepens your relationship. Ask Cindy, my wife. This is what we do. The Holy Spirit would not deprive us of our station in life. He wouldn't deprive us of our comfort, of our stuff, of our relationships, of our job, of our income, any of that. He doesn't wrest things from us by force. He's not forceful. Rather, he's patient. And if you give every situation in life over to him, he has use for it. Our inner teacher has use for it. He can use your relationships for good. For joy, for freedom, rather than for pain and exclusion. And so we do have that choice. We can give our special relationships over to the Holy Spirit. He wouldn't deprive us of them. You don't have to give them up. Just give them over to him. And let the Holy Spirit use your special relationships for joy and freedom rather than for pain and guilt and suffering and war and battle and all that stuff. It's a simple choice that we can make. Now, there is another layer of fear that may arise. It may well arise, and, and perhaps it arises for you. I don't know. This is a common thing. We often, all too often, believe that in giving over our relationships, every situation in life to the Holy Spirit means giving our power away. We fear to give what little power we have a way here in the world. Right? We don't want to give it away to an outside source. Well, let me reassure you, you are not doing that. The Holy Spirit is part of you. Yes, the Holy Spirit is part of you. It is part of our mind. It's part of you. You are not in giving over your relationships, your situations in life, all of them, in giving them away to the Holy Spirit. You're just saying, here, let's use this for joy and freedom rather than for pain and guilt. Let's use it for the purposes of healing the mind. I give this over to you. That's all we're saying. Rather than giving away our power to an outside source, we're actually accessing our power. It's part of our mind. So all of this course, if you've guessed, is about changing our mind. We can have a continued dream of guilt and fear, and appear to be spinning and spinning around in suffering, samsara from Buddhism, yeah, the wheel. Round and round we go. Where it stops, nobody knows. Okay, well, what wheel? We have the opportunity to get off the wheel at all times. <laughs> we do. We have the opportunity to give over our entire experience, everything in our lives, 
for the purposes of healing the mind. We're invited to change our mind about who we think we are. Spoiler alert, it's not this, which we all know, or we would not be here. We're invited to change our, our mind. And what happens is we begin to have a more peaceful dream. We begin with the practice of true forgiveness to have a more peaceful experience. Now, this may not appear to be a quantum leap in leaps and bounds where you experience all of this in the next 15 minutes. I mean, it's possible, but in the event that doesn't happen, don't be surprised. Most of us get what looks like a gradual process. So how then do we know this is working? Well, think of who you were and what you were doing and, and your mind set, your state of mind when you began this practice, or if you are not a course student, whatever practice you are currently doing. Think of who you were then, even if it was just last week, and think of who you are now. It is a very common experience to experience something right now, after however much time of spiritual practice, that doesn't bother you. Yet when you began, it would have driven you insane. Months later, or weeks later, or years later, it doesn't even register. Something that would have caused you to completely lose your equilibrium no longer even registers. That is a clear indication that this is working. It's about changing our mind. You will have noticed that you've changed your mind. What used to bother you doesn't bother you anymore. Common and uplifting and my hope is that that serves as a motivation to continue, to keep going. Because what happens is before we finally awaken, we begin to dream a more peaceful dream. Things don't bother us as much. We're more patient. We're kinder. We're more loving. And voila, what we appear to see begins to change. All that I or any teacher can do with the convention of words is point to that. You've got to walk the path, and I invite you to do that because you have help along the way, starting with the loving and patient and certain, certain guidance of your inner teacher. Now, I'm also available to help. There are other teachers and other people that are available to help you on your journey. And so to that extent, should you have any questions at all, please feel welcome to leave them here. This comment thread on YouTube is in fact the perfect place to ask a question. So please do. Um, and if you would like to just pop in and say hello, I'd love to hear from you. So please do that as well. Now, if you have not subscribed, please do that. This is the prompt in the corner of your screen. Click that arrow or hover over that. You'll be invited to join us. And several videos appear each week. This course is a course in mind training, and it aims to turn our perception right side up. <laughs> it is upside down. Which, even if we choose to deny it, we all know is true. Or we wouldn't be here anyway right? I mean, something, something has caused you to watch this video today. So there is always a message from your inner teacher. Always. What that is, only you will know. But when you hear it, you'll know you heard it. And it would be very, very kind of you to consider that and to put it into practice, because that is indeed how we learn the best. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I will speak to all of you very soon.